thanks very much for, um, for staying after Rod's excellent session. Um, I guess, first of all, coming from Wellington, I am used to touching patients, unlike Rod's suggestion. Uh, and secondly, um, I think it's fantastic that I'm following him because, of course, he's done a fantastic introduction for my talk, which is about palliation. And I think you can see from the title that I'm probably going to be um, slightly out on a limb here, pushing a barrow. So I'm very grateful to the organisers for letting me come here and, and give you my cynical, twisted view about atrial fibrillation and its, and its management. And I guess for those of you who are interested, um, most of us have seen this movie clip or read the book, and I think that's how probably most of us think about atrial fibrillation. It's a dark art the management of atrial fibrillation, the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. And rather than using 60 minutes to show you 100 slides, um, I'll sprint through a few, but concentrate on a couple of areas that I think are relevant. One of which isn't stopping death, but talking about rate control. I'm going to focus predominantly on rhythm control and touch on some of my foibles about, uh, about anticoagulation and hopefully uh, entertain you with some ideas about mechanisms. Um, so in terms of disclosures, I, I guess the, the biggest thing is I'm biased. Um, I believe in atrial fibrillation management, and I believe in treatment of atrial fibrillation with the idea of improving control, not cure. So I've got you here under false pretenses. I've also got a bias in that I do these procedures, and I do them in public and in private, the private mainly to bolster the public waiting lists and make sure we've got space. But I've also got another um, disclosure, and that is that I do active research work uh, in a basic science, um, translational science perspective, and that involves company donation of products that we use for some of the research work. And that's through the university, and that's in part HRC funded. So I, I guess the big thing is curing atrial fibrillation is quite popular in, in the in the internet. You can see here that there's a whole load of things here about how to treat or cure. And if you look carefully, you'll see that there are quite easy ways to open your wallet to get a cure for your atrial fibrillation. And unfortunately, it's not just uh, these sorts of characters who are claiming all sorts of great expertise, but people like myself, or my colleagues, should I say, have also been responsible with statements like, you know, curing atrial fibrillation with certain types of procedures. So I think we're all tarred with the same brush, and the reason why we're interested in so-called curing atrial fibrillation is we all recognise that, that atrial fibrillation is a very problematic condition for some patients. I don't, I don't know how many people here recognise the atrial fibrillation guideline on the left here with the green banner. Um, does anybody here use it still? Silence. One person. And, and that's good because it's actually quite a good tome, but it's published in 2006. It's 10 years old. And there's a lot that's happened in the 10 years. And of course, some of that's incorporated in this more recent BPAC guideline on the right that some of you all have had access to. I'm going to touch on these things, though. These are the current guidelines. And uh, the sort of the magic tome, if you like, is this AHA, the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology guideline, which for 76 pages is not something one should read whilst one's driving in Auckland traffic, and it's not available on podcasts, sorry. Um, the Canadian guideline at the bottom, however, is somewhat more palatable and more manageable uh, with less pages, um, and I would recommend that that's a good starting point if you're interested in, in the guidelines. I guess one of the problems is guidelines um, are just that, and not all of us follow them. So here's some hope for you as, as a general practitioner versus a specialist. The specialists don't necessarily follow the guidelines, and I guess the problem always is that it's very easy for somebody to stand up and say, this is what we should do, but the nuts and bolts are you've got the patient in front of you, and some of the discussions are not really covered well in the guidelines. 
So what I hope that we'll, we'll be able to cover is some stuff to help you with some of those, um, some of those comments. This is, um, this is one of my favorite patients. This guy was, I think, 78 or, or coming on 80, and he, he turned up to clinic very dissatisfied with the care he'd had um, from his previous doctors with a tight list of all of the episodes of atrial fibrillation he'd had since October. And you can see on the right-hand panel uh, some halter monitoring showing at times sinus rhythm, other times atrial fibrillation. And this is the sort of patient I really want to focus on today because these are the patients who are the ones that I end up seeing and that you end up referring. Because you end up managing most patients with atrial fibrillation in a very different way that I don't get to see. And this is probably some hope. You can have atrial fibrillation and not be so plagued. Most of you will recognize Barry Manilow. He claims that he feels better when he's in a normal rhythm and he can sing and his music's better. Well, that's fantastic. Most patients in atrial fibrillation don't even know they're in AF. And you all know these sorts of patients. So to follow on from Rod's talk about being at peace, most of you already know that most patients with atrial fibrillation are not at peace if they've got symptoms. Some of them are driven completely bonkers. They hate it. They hate the discomfort, they hate the irregularity, they hate the breathlessness, the exercise and capacity. And increasingly, as medical professionals, we're recognizing that atrial fibrillation isn't just a nuisance. It actually is a very important problem that we really have to grapple with. And it's one of a number of, of, of areas that I think have been undercooked before in terms of this, the sort of data about the impact of AF in terms of dementia, mortality, and morbidity. So those are some rough numbers, just to be fairly sobering if you're not already sober at this time of the day. Most of you recognize this guy. This slide is just to remind me to remind you that most of the people we see with atrial fibrillation have AF because they've got atria that are in trouble, and the main problem is the atria and their comorbidities. President Bush, however, his atrial fibrillation, sure, he's susceptible, he's old, he's male, but he also was thyrotoxic when he went into AF, which is kind of interesting because I don't get to see many thyrotoxic patients with AF, but you might. And I guess that brings up the point that when we see a patient with AF, we always want to look for the underlying potential reversible causes. And you've seen hundreds of lists like this. There are hundreds of diagnoses that are potential but most of the AF that I deal with is AF in people with structural heart disease or who have got some of the common other risk factors that we'll talk about in a bit. The reason for pointing this out, of course, is if you've got AF, that AF is just an incomplete diagnosis because one person's AF is different from another person's AF. Their risk factor profile, their anatomy, all these other things means that AF is very much a spectrum. And to say that management for one type of AF should be the same as management for another type of AF, of course, is ridiculous. You've got to get to the bottom of why the person's gone into AF to tailor some of your therapies. You know this already. AF is a very complex interplay between structure and function. Um, and increasingly, we're becoming more aware of the role, for example, of the nervous system, uh, of genetics, and of course of the aging uh, factors as well. Uh, Matt Dawes has talked a bit yesterday about hypertension in AF, I think. Um, certainly that is a hot topic, if we're allowed to use the term hot. And many of you have seen this sort of information before. On the top banner is this concept of a barcode, with every black stripe being an episode of atrial fibrillation. Over time, you get more and more episodes of atrial fibrillation. Eventually, the bar becomes solid black as you go into permanent atrial fibrillation. The trouble is we don't know where a patient is on their particular time course with that atrial fibrillation because they may have been having episodes that they weren't aware of. They may have been having the progenitors that you didn't detect. On the bottom is a bar chart just highlighting the impact of various additional comorbidities on the chance of getting atrial fibrillation and the type of atrial fibrillation. 
And quite clearly, as you move from left to right, the more comorbidities you have, the more likelihood you will have more deranged atria, more complex atrial fibrillation. And going along with this is the concept that atrial fibrillation, whatever the milieu is, the atrial fibrillation is triggered often by ectopics that originate from the pulmonary veins, but not exclusively. And that as time goes on and you get more and more triggers, you get atrial remodeling and you move into structural heart disease and fibrosis. And this is a new concept that's really become proven with a, quite a lot of basic science research over the last 10, 15 years. If there's time, we can talk about rotors and drivers because some of your patients will come to you saying, I've read about rotor ablation, where can I go for that? Uh, and I can hopefully dispel that that's a cure. So this is the, the seminal work from the Bordeaux group. Uh, from Michelle Hassegier, which highlighted the role of triggers to start off atrial fibrillation. And they did some great work mapping the left atrium, although, of course, they weren't the first. The Germans were, but they, um, they weren't able to publish so eloquently. And they did their stuff uh, two decades before the French. But the French got there and got it published, and they showed that, that a lot of triggers come from the, from the pulmonary veins. And as time's gone on, we've learned more and more about the sort of electrical behaviours in the atrium. And we kind of, at medical school, get taught that the atrium are just two bags, the left and right atrium. But it's become increasingly clear that there are different structural and electrical behaviours in different parts of the atria. And there's a gradient between the left and right atrium, between the pulmonary veins, the antrum where the veins drain into, and the body of the left atrium. And that's evidenced by uh, these action potentials that you'll see over here as we get older, our action potentials change. When we go into atrial fibrillation, our action potential behaviours change. And those weird things that you remember from medical school called uh, refractory periods also change. And going along with that, uh, if you look at various um, fancy mapping studies, they correlate with increasing degrees of fibrosis in the atria. So this concept of electrical and mechanical remodeling is, is very clearly proven. The trouble is we don't know what to do about it, or do we? Now, the work that I do with the bioengineering group and physiology department at Auckland is very much focused on structural behaviours rather than functional, though there are others in the department doing, doing this uh, work. But we've really concentrated on fibres and, and the role that this twisting of fibres and the interplay with uh, the channels has on promoting atrial fibrillation. And it's very clear that the troubles are often located on the posterior left atrium, and you'll see the cartoon on the top right panel uh, showing the four pulmonary veins in the left atrium from the posterior aspect. But bear in mind that the SVC and right atrium are parked right in front. And I won't bore you, given the time, uh, with some of the details there. And likewise, we'll skip over that. That was just talking about fibrosis and the change in the atrium over time with fancy, um, uh, fancy um, Fourier transforms. How many people have seen a patient like this? Most of you will recognize the abbreviation on the top line there. That's an orthopedic registrar clerking the patient in. And you are the house officer being sent, or the registrar, medical registrar, being sent to see the patient. Some poor old dude who's fractured the neck of femur, they need something done, they're having an operation tomorrow, and lo and behold, they're clerked in and they're found to be an atrial fibrillation. Well, if they're asymptomatic, their management's pretty easy. It's pretty straightforward. Once they've got through their operation, be it a cataract extraction or a neck of femur, or they've come in for their hypertension check and you found them in AF, if they're asymptomatic, you can't make them feel any better. You can certainly help prevent a complication from their atrial fibrillation, but the treatments you might give to do that carry with them some risk. So this is where this whole issue of rate control and stroke prophylaxis comes into play. And I guess you're all very familiar with the idea that fast heart rates can cause rate-related cardiomyopathies in some patients, but we are hopeless at predicting who and when. But as a general rule, we talk about achieving rate control. Trouble is, 
like Matt Dawes talked about yesterday, what is good blood pressure control? Well, the trials that are out there give us very mixed messages. Heart rate control, we generally say, should be a resting rate less than 80 to 90 beats per minute. And with a six minute walk, somewhere around about 100, 110 maximum. But there are conflicting trial results about that. And I'll talk about uh, a couple of those in a minute. Rate control, of course, predominantly is used for those with fast heart rates. There is the other side where people are going too slowly. And certainly there is a role there for backup pacing to support slow heart rates and atrial fibrillation. Um, there's also a role for pacemakers when somebody's got poor rate control despite your best efforts with drugs. And that's part of a staged procedure when we might actually take out the atrial, uh, atrioventricular node. Now, how many people here have heard of the AFFIRM trial? Probably not many, a few. Um, the AFFIRM trial, I think, did an awful lot of harm. The AFFIRM trial was trying to compare rate control versus rhythm control. And I think, generally, the concepts were good, but it's been misinterpreted. And essentially, they, the AFFIRM study tried to, to contain people with fairly decent doses of certain drugs to keep them in sinus rhythm or to provide a rate control that was perhaps a bit more strict than PF and some other trials. But in the end, they showed that there was no difference in their primary composite endpoints of death and various other catastrophic cardiac events. There was a trend to a higher death rate in those who had rhythm control, and that was in part contributed to by the types of drugs being used for rhythm control, amiodarone and sotalol and their prorhythmic problems, but also because when people thought they'd achieved rhythm control, they stopped the anticoagulation. So people got strokes and died. And unfortunately, this trial's been misinterpreted, saying there's no point in trying to keep people in sinus rhythm, where in fact, there is a point, particularly when the person's highly symptomatic. I'll just skip through these slides for time, but essentially, there are various other trials that have been out there uh, of more recent times, suggesting that rate control, there's a different philosophy between those who believe in a very strict tight rate control and those who believe in a more lenient rate control. The trouble is it's, th these are not good trials because, for example, they haven't looked at activity heart rates. So, for example, in race two, they halter monitored, the, halter monitored those who are in the strict protocol uh, um, but didn't do that for those who are in the, in the lenient, so you've got no comparator. But essentially, if you've got a heart rate less than 100 uh, at rest, then, um, uh, then you're providing good rate control. Does it make any difference to mortality? No. Does it make any difference to symptoms? No. But we do it to prevent those who are likely to go into uh, go uh, get uh, rate-related cardiomyopathies, particularly those who are going fast who are not aware of things. So the summary from the guidelines is very much rate control with these agents. And I think you can see that there's not many of them. And they're common. They're accessible to us in New Zealand. Just skip through this if I can. Oops. Why is that not advancing? So you can see here, this is a, a story of somebody who's become symptomatic, um, but there's potentially lots of reasons for that. He's got bad LV function, he's got poor heart rate control, booze is a factor, potentially, and he's got um, structural heart disease. And the question here is, what do we do for this sort of patient? Well, this is where we should be controlling various factors for this person. We should be thinking about trying to restore sinus rhythm. The trouble is, if you have a look at this sort of chart here, somebody with atrial fibrillation behaves very differently depending on what type of atrial fibrillation they've got. And you can see in the dotted red line, those who flick in and out of AF, and AF for less than seven days, actually don't do too badly in the short term. But if you've got more long-lasting AF, more persistent AF, your chance of staying in sinus rhythm is quite poor. And part of our trouble is that our therapeutic options to keep people in, in sinus rhythm are very limited. 
if you look at that drug list there, you'll see that there's nothing new from when you were at medical school. In fact, some of the drugs have gone. Pacemakers, devices, they were quite trendy in the sort of late 90s. They've kind of settled down. They've got a very niche role uh, for certain cases. And certainly giving people cardioversion through an implanted atrioverter, not a defibrillator, an atrioverter, that's well gone out of vogue because that was extremely poorly tolerated and unpopular. And of course, one of the things that's coming up now is the role of surgical type approaches to provide additional support to keep people in sinus rhythm. So if you look at this small study, it's an old study, but there are numerous studies very similar to it with more recent data. Essentially, if you're on an antiarrhythmic drug and you've had any atrial fibrillation, your chance long-term of staying in sinus rhythm is quite poor. With ablation in the dotted blue line, your chance of staying in sinus rhythm, or the, the delay until you go back into AF, is quite long. But it's only effective in two-thirds or three-quarters of patients. There's a whole group of patients who don't respond to no matter what you do. So there are big issues about how we improve that and what we do to try and um, secure sinus rhythm, if at all possible. This is what I do um, and is becoming an increasingly popular treatment for atrial fibrillation to provide control. Notice I'm not using the word cure, unlike some of my colleagues who were very enthusiastic about using ablation to cure atrial fibrillation. There are very few patients who get cured with a surgical procedure. Unless you treat the comorbidities or do an extensive open procedure, your chance of staying in sinus rhythm for 20, 30 years is yet unknown because we don't have that long-term data. But essentially what happens with an ablation is that we build various loops around the pulmonary veins or a permutation of that to ring fence in those triggers that I showed you that the Bordeaux group looked at. And you can see on the right-hand panels a variety of different shaped catheters uh, that are used to explore the veins, to map where the triggers might be, used, uh, might be coming from, and then there's an ablation catheter on the x-ray at the bottom actually doing the work to cauterize the tissue to try and build a fire break to contain those triggers. And this is the sort of stuff that we might see uh, during an EP case. We'll just concentrate on this very top panel. Sorry about the projection here. And the laser pointer is dying. Um, if you have a look at the signals which say PV, these are the signals coming from the pulmonary veins. And the pulmonary veins here have become active after we've given something to stir them up. And what we're doing with ablation is progressively changing the electrical activation as we build a successful fire break or wall. And here we are with those pulmonary veins now quiet. So that's essentially what an AF ablation is, is building a ring around the pulmonary veins. Here are the pulmonary veins. There's the left atrial appendage on this person's CT scan. There's a tremendous variation in the anatomy. So you can imagine trying to balance a catheter with a three millimeter tip on this knife edge is quite a feat, whereas here it's a little bit e easier. So that's called surfing the ridge. And you can have spectacular falls. There are different types of technologies. Uh, this is a cryo catheter, the cryo balloon or arctic front, which aims to build uh, a fire break, if you like, around the veins, but instead of by burning, it's by freezing. There are other tricks as well. But they're all trying to do the same thing, which is to build a barrier to stop these veins from firing off. And you can see that there are various permutations that involve the back of the left atrium and the right atrium as well. So with these various technologies, one can improve the success rates, but only up to about 80%. So there's still a group of people who do not respond to this treatment. Should atrial fibrillation ablation be a first-line treatment? Well, I think the answer is intuitively it makes sense to sort of try and tackle things earlier on in the person's career before they get up to these more prolonged episodes where there's more damage done to the heart. But the problem is that these procedures carry with them the risk of potential complications, be it groin access, be it pulmonary vein stenosis, stroke, 
And these are very severe complications if they, if they do occur. Fortunately, they're not common, but when they happen, they're very important. And there are a number of studies which are eagerly awaited. RAF2 is reported, but other studies suggesting that, um, or exploring the idea that earlier intervention may in fact be much better for the long haul. But watch this space. Having said that, the guidelines now incorporate catheter ablation as very much part of the commonly used strategy to try and control somebody's atrial fibrillation and keep them in sinus rhythm. You notice in the States, they have other agents that we don't have access to here except in trial or compassionate basis. Um, but essentially, it's sotalol, amiodarone. Calcium antagonists are good in sheep. They're good for rate control in humans. They're not so potent as antiarrhythmics. So who should have atrial fibrillation in New Zealand? Um, at the moment, uh, we're very restrictive. One of the big things is people often read on the internet, they say, oh, I'm going to have an ablation, it's going to get me off my drugs, it's going to prevent stroke. But that's unfortunately not proven yet. Um, and we certainly do not provide ablation to get people off their drugs. Ablation is very much housed in that part of the management to help control. It certainly helps improve quality of life, um, and we have good data now suggesting that it improves left ventricular performance. But we really are restricting this sort of work to those who have failed to respond to standard medical therapy. And in New Zealand, that means two antiarrhythmic agents. In the UK, it's down to one antiarrhythmic agent as experience has grown and as they've seen the impact of um, some of the newer procedures. Clearly, those who are highly symptomatic are those we want to do because they, they're the ones who plague you the most. Um, those who have got paroxysmal AF tend to do better than those with more deranged atria, but conversely, those who have got deranged atria often have bigger problems and have the most to benefit if we can try and get them into sinus rhythm. What I want to concentrate on um, is some of the newer stuff that's come out, which perhaps is more difficult because as a proceduralist, I don't get much time to see these patients. I see them in clinic, I see them for follow-up. But one of the problems that's coming out more and more is the recognition that our procedure success rates are blunted by the fact that we failed to address some of the fundamental promoters of atrial fibrillation. Um, and if you look at this particular slide, this is um, some work from the Adelaide group where they've taken the observation that obese patients tend to do less well than non-obese patients and did some very elegant work initially with three flocks of sheep, two of whom they allowed to get obese on free-range rations and one flock of sheep that they kept on standard rations. And the obese sheep got so obese that quite a number of them couldn't be put through a human MRI scanner. That's how big they got. One of the obese flocks, they then slimmed down to the same size as the control flock. And then they subjected those sheep to a whole battery of tests, chemical, histological, radiological, electrical. And I won't bore you with the bits at the bottom here, with the fading uh, pointer, but essentially the message was that the obese sheep, of course, had gross derangement of all sorts of different things, inflammatory indices, electrical misbehavior, fibrosis, you name it. But the fascinating thing was the sheep that were slimmed down were almost back to the baseline as the control flock. And that's without drugs and without ablation procedures or surgical intervention, just with weight reduction. And as a result of that, the group then went on and did some seminal work looking at the same sorts of things in humans, not slaughtering them, um, but the same sort of work in humans with weight loss clinics as part of their AF management. And the fascinating thing was that with weight loss, they were able to obtain quite remarkable improvements to people's AF burden with and without ablation work. And I won't bore you with the, the, the details, but essentially um, the red bars are those who had weight loss of more than 10% of their baseline body weight. Um, 
compared to those who had minimal weight loss. And it did matter whether you lost weight in a steady fashion or whether you were fluctuating. The red bar on this graph showing those who lost weight uh, on the left-hand panel in a steady fashion, whereas the um, browner bar at the bottom shows those who made no weight change or, in fact, gained weight despite interventions. So changing one's weight can have a dramatic impact in terms of the frequency of AF events and the freedom from AF events, be it post-ablation or without ablation. To the point that in certain centres they will not take obese patients for ablation work. And that's because doing an ablation on a patient carries with it risks, an obese patient carries extra risks. Risks of vascular access, risks of perforation, management of the perforation can be much more difficult. Complications such as phrenic nerve palsy is poorly tolerated in some obese patients. So there's all these sorts of issues about um, tackling obese patients. On the other hand, these obese patients have got the most to gain if they're unable to exercise because of their atrial fibrillation. So there's a, a difficult quandary there about trying to get obese patients slim enough for the procedure, but actually getting them well enough to actually exercise to get slim enough for the procedure. And I think, from my perspective, one of the glaring errors in our management in New Zealand is the fact that we do not provide bariatric medicine services within our public hospitals. Uh, yes, there is bariatric surgery, but that's extremely restricted. And I think that's something that would be a, a worthwhile uh, lunchtime discussion. I'm going to skip through this stuff because you already know most of, of this about, about anticoagulation. Frankly, I find this really irritating that I'm coming to you to tell you about warfarin and NOAX. You know more about it than I do. I get to see the problems with the warfarin and the NOAX. But I thought I would just focus on a couple of points about the anticoagulation. Because I think there's perhaps in the community some misunderstanding about what we should be using for risk scores, who should be anticoagulated and who shouldn't be. You'll all be very familiar with this idea that Anticoagulation clearly reduces the risk of, of an embolic event. But not all embolic events come from the heart, of course. There's the neck and the head. Um, but we know that we should be intervening in those who are self-selected uh, by declaring a stroke or by being an AF. And there's very clear data now standing back many decades. What's also clear is antiplatelet agents aren't enough. There's only one study which shows any benefit over placebo, and that was in 1991, the SPAF study. The rest of them show no additional benefit compared to placebo, let alone compared to anticoagulation. So it's a no-brainer. If you've got AF and you meet certain criteria, you should be thinking about anticoagulation. The trouble is, there's a lot of patients who don't want to be anticoagulated, and there's some patients who shouldn't be anticoagulated. And I think we've taken this rather sort of bulldozer approach to assessing patients um, with this big push for using the chance score. And I think the chance score has done some marvelous things to helping us think about what we need to do. But remember, the chance score is only one way of looking at things. And it's very clear as time has gone on with these big databases out there now that the chance score has its shortcomings. And one of the biggest shortcomings is what to do with those patients in the gray area with the CHADS score of one. And this is where the CHADS VAS score, I think, adds some benefit. And this is but one of many papers looking at how we can better use the CHADS type scores to tailor anticoagulation for patients, to give it to the, to concentrate on those who really need it. And if you've got a CHADS VAS score of one, you can see on that blue line at the bottom, that your chance of an event is pretty small. And you probably don't need to be on anticoagulation compared to those who've got chance scores of two or greater. You can see the chance score of one tracking differently, but chance VASC helps separate out that gray area where we're not sure the chance score of one, do we anticoagulate or not? Do we give them antiplatelets or not? <coughs> 
the chance VAS gives you that option to screen out those who you can avoid anticoagulating. Now, you've been bombarded by numerous meetings, I'm sure, and by the pharma crews about the latest and greatest NOACs. Um, on the top part there, there's Rely, Rocket, Aristotle. There's the Temi study, all looking at different types of NOACs. And I'm not going to go through this chart in any detail, but just to remind you that one of the biggest problems with these trials is who they put in. And you'll notice there that only a third of the participants are actually women. And the other thing that I find disturbing is that when they're comparing their drug to warfarin, that the warfarin control is barely optimal in quite a number of their studies, a time and therapeutic range of around 65%. Okay? If you're below 65%, you're really no better off on placebo. So there's a comparison that's being used in some of these trials, which you just have to be aware of when you look at this sort of data. Having said that, you know, it's very clear if you're taking a NOAC that you do very well uh, in terms of risk reduction from uh, hemorrhagic stroke, ischemic stroke. The big um, signal where warfarin is better than a NOAC is the risk with gastrointestinal bleeding. And of course, you're all familiar with the GI side effects that probably a third of patients uh, in my experience, I don't know what yours is, but roughly a third of patients will report. So I think NOACs are definitely a very viable option for patients. Of course, much more reliable. You don't have the expense and the discomfort of blood tests. You don't have the um, expense and the discomfort of having to dose. Um, so there are quite big advantages with thinking about NOACs, but there are also disadvantages. I think it's very clear, though, that the trend overseas is for an increased first prescription with NOAX rather than warfarin. And I think that's just acknowledging the fact that compliance with NOAX, as seen on the bottom panel, is significantly better uh, if you're using a NOAX compared to warfarin. And that just makes good practice sense. However, if I've got a patient on warfarin who's been stable and fine, I leave them on the warfarin. I have to have a good reason to change them. But if you're initiating somebody, then a NOAC's not a bad idea. The one downside is if they're having a procedure, and we can talk about that uh, in, in a discussion, perhaps. Um, how many people here use bleeding risks? A couple? Do most people here use CHADS or CHAZVAS? Hands up for CHADS. Not many people. So, and some people use CHAZVAS. So, you kind of already converted, so I'm preaching to the, preaching to the converted. Um, my bias about the bleeding risks is that they are overlapping with the Chads, Chads vas type scores. And as such, their positive predictive values are quite low. So they're a useful concept to think of and to, to reflect on whether you should be giving the person anticoagulation. But they're not particularly helpful in the management of the patients I see. It may be quite different in your practice. So here we are. Here's the, um, the current European and uh, American guidelines for anticoagulation. And for those of you still awake uh, and without presbyopia, um, you will see that it's quite obvious. Uh, I prefer the Canadian chart because it's easier for me to read and it makes a bit more intuitive sense, but it's saying the same thing. And that is essentially if you've got atrial fibrillation and you're over 65, you should be on some form of oral anticoagulation. The trouble with these guidelines are, though, they don't differentiate for those with different types of atrial fibrillation, nor do they allow for different types of comorbidities. So it's very much a blunderbuss approach. And I think over the next decade or so, we will get more information about who we really need to think of more carefully about with our anticoagulation as we get better at stratifying patient groups. This is a hot potato. Um, the National Health Committee clearly has got its guns on saving dollars and investing money where there is proven utility, and I applaud that. I think that's a great idea. They've chosen to look at atrial fibrillation catheter ablations, 
um, and it's been an interesting review process there. They have chosen not to approve the left atrial appendage occlusion devices, which is an ongoing source of trouble. Most of you will be aware that uh, if you look on the uh, transesophageal echo panels on the, on the left, you can see the left atrial appendage poorly uh, in here, about to get a plug into it, a watchman device, to block off the appendage. Because as you know, much of the left atrial, um, uh, left atrial appendage, when it's in atrial fibrillation, doesn't contract, it doesn't wash itself out. And it's thought that the majority of thrombus initially originates from the left atrial appendage. So intuitively it makes sense to exclude it from the circulation, and that's what the watchman device is trying to do, and it's an example of the watchman here going into the left atrial appendage here. There are other tools, other devices, including the lariat, which is put in percutaneously through the pericardial space. They're all trying to do the same thing, which is to exclude the appendage as a source of thrombus. Now, quite what the role of this would be long-term, we don't know, but there's very clear evidence um, that mechanistically it makes a difference, but like catheter ablation, there are problems. It doesn't suit everybody's anatomy. There can be complications putting these things in. Nonetheless, for the right patient, this may be a viable option to avoid anticoagulation in certain patient groups. But again, the CHADS-VAS score doesn't factor obliterating the left atrial appendage from the equation. So if you have a patient with an occlusion device, we're still thinking about treating per their risk factors. It's the same as if they've had an AF ablation. Even if they're in sinus rhythm, we are still treating as per their risk factors because the data that's out there cannot differentiate between those who are in AF and those who are in sinus rhythm. Thanks. Two. OK, I'm going to finish on these particular points here, and that is the issue around trying to prevent troubles. And as you can see um, on the bottom, there's a, a paper there called the Race 3, which is looking at preventative strategies, upstream strategies, to try and avoid atrial fibrillation fibrosis. And that's using stuff that we've already got ac access to, except for the bariatric uh, side of things. And it's talking about doing things, as Matt Dawes has talked about, treating hypertension, treating obesity. But what are the targets? How low should the blood pressure be to try and reduce fibrosis? Well, there's plenty of papers out there claiming 130 and 80 is the top limit. But patients with hypertension, the definitions of hypertension as for when they entered these trials, vary significantly. So we don't have good data on what the right target should be yet. So I think to summarize, this talk of curing atrial fibrillation is very attractive. It's a great concept. We're not there yet. I don't think we will ever be there yet. I think we should be concentrating on better control. We can certainly improve that control if we are better at selecting the right targets, doing things at an earlier stage in the disease career. Obviously that involves finding better tools, knowing what to do in terms of how far we should push, how much atrium we should ablate or obliterate. But clearly the main push is thinking about remedial things that we can control, and obesity is one of the big things. Those of you who read blogs, this is John Mandrola, who's a very influential writer for the uh, heart.org, who is an EP doc as well. And I'll leave you to read these statements that he has on his blog. And I think he says an awful lot of good sense stuff there. There's no cure for AF. Be very wary of this blunderbuss, one hammer approach that we get at our cardiology clinics and at our emergency departments. Remember that having bruising from your anticoagulation is perhaps better than having a stroke. And that patients who jump up and down in, in your surgery wanting an AF ablation, you need to remind them that ablation is only part of their management and it's not perfect. So I'll leave you with some um, 
resource um, uh, for you to think about. The NICE guidelines, um, it's actually www.nice.org.uk. If you leave the UK off, you'll get into one of those salacious websites that Bruce Arrow was talking about. Um, it's a huge website. Uh, NICE, of course, stands for National Institute of Clinical Excellence. Um, and they cover things like treatment of cancers, headache syndromes, and gynecological problems, as well as cardiac. But they've re-released uh, and updated their guidelines on AF management for patients and for medical practitioners, and it's a very useful resource. HRS Online stands for Heart Rhythm Society Online. That's a good one. And at the bottom there, there's the AHA guidelines with a push button. If you go onto the website, that's quite a useful way of sneaking through things. Thank you.